What the heck? Togon. Howdy, YouTube. Since everybody seems to be doing their favorite, uh, or I'm sorry, mega favorite number, I figured I would share mine. Um, I did not even slightly bother to find out if um, this had already been done, but I figured I'd share it. So even though I'm a big math guy, I've never done a physics uh, video in my life, and I'm not really sure why I'm standing right now, I must tell you that my favorite mega number is precisely 299,792,458, which is of course the dimensional which is of course the dimensionless quantity that when paired with the unit's meters per second is precisely the speed of light in a vacuum. In fact, it's the speed of light everywhere, uh, it's just that when there's stuff around, light gets its path diverted and so it takes a longer path in a wave-particle duality or whatever, uh, and it's my favorite number above a million because I'm pretty sure it's the only one that I have memorized and it's got some beautiful math tied to it that I'd love to share you in this, that I'd love to share with you in this very short video. So, uh, without further ado, the speed of light. Okay, so it's time to learn a little bit about the speed of light. Now, the number that's associated with it is sort of seemingly random, uh, but let's take a look at it. So, we know, sort of know, I guess it's been told to uh, most of us, that the speed of light, represented usually by this lowercase letter c, is precisely equal to 299,792,458 meters per second. Now in practice when wielding the equations, the, the exact number of this is sort of irrelevant and so it's just represented as C and a lot of the time uh, C is treated as sort of the unit measurement in relativity um, for, for, for very good reason. Uh, the reason it's this precise number is because we now def something moved. We now define the meter as the distance that light travels, travels, travels in one second divided by the number 299,792,458. Now that doesn't really answer the question because all I've done is shift around the uh, equation a little bit or this definition here, uh, moreover. Um, but what this does is it explains to us sort of where this number comes from. So why isn't it just 300 million, right? We're pretty much right there. Um, the issue is that the meter had already been defined by the time relativity had been discovered. And so, as far as I'm aware, the reason why it's this exact number is because we had a meter defined, and that was the standard unit of length, and we could measure how far light traveled in one second, quite, quite accurately. And so all we did was figure out what's the closest integer amount of the meter that we already knew fitting inside of that distance, and then if there was some rounding error, I imagine uh, the distance wasn't changed, the seconds weren't changed, I imagine the meter was probably changed ever so slightly to accommodate the fact that it is now precisely this integer value of meters. That's my guess as to why it's that number. I would imagine that if uh, they had changed it to 300 million meters per second and thus had to uh, make the meter smaller. By that much smaller, it might have changed like way too much about our modern life to be able to actually do that reliably. So I totally get why they wouldn't want to do something like that. And now we just have to deal with a slightly cumbersome number. So I'm going to show you a couple of aspects of using the speed of light in some very basic equations of general relativity to sort of spark to sort of to sort of spark some interest in the topic of this number, this number 299,792,458 meters per second, a very very lovely number. Uh, if this is anybody's telephone number, I don't know, give me a call or something. Uh, it's one digit too short. <laughs> so maybe if you get you know one two nine nine or something, something like that. I don't know, I'm just being stupid now. Um, all right, so let's take a look at some stuff. Let's talk, let's talk about a physical scenario. Time to break out the big guns. Finally gonna open these. Oh yeah. Uh, so satisfying. Very good, very good. All right, all right. 12 plus two bonus. Thank you very much, Expo. Go Washington Expos. Wait, it's the Washington Nationals now. It was the... Where the hell did the Expos play? Montreal? Something like that? I don't know. Who cares? So we have ourselves a box on wheels. A box on wheels. 
Maybe it's rolling on the ground, maybe it's rolling on a track, it doesn't really matter. But inside that box we have a laser and a mirror up top that will reflect the laser. And now the laser may not reflect off, the laser beam may not reflect off the laser, but if it doesn't, it, the laser beam just shoots another beam of light. Uh, perhaps it's a photon, I'm not really sure, but essentially this photon could theoretically just be bouncing between these two things. And so we could imagine uh, a photon going up, striking the mirror, and then coming back down. And now imagine these two are the same photon. I'm just trying to distinguish their arrows. So the orange arrow is going up, the pink arrow is going down. And these two, uh, these two, this, this, this particle, this photon of light, travels some distance d, and it travels at the speed of light while it's doing that, and it takes some amount of time to do that. But now imagine if this cart was moving. We would see, you know, we would see the cart here, moving along, right, frame by frame, and then it would be over here, right, everything's the same, it's moving along, it's moving along, it's moving along, and then we get to this point here, so this is motion being pictured here, this thing is moving in that direction, and we will see this occur. So this, this view is for someone that's standing inside of the cart, right, so we imagine somebody in the cart, a little stick figure, right, this person sees the light beam go up and down vertically and ver perfectly vertically like that. But to someone standing on the foreground, watching this go on, they will see this. They will see the orange beam travel in this direction, reflect off the mirror, right? All the while, because imagine this is a continuous thing, right? This card is just moving along, and from this person's perspective, the light has gone straight up and it's hit the mirror, and it's going to come straight back down, but from this person's perspective, not moving relative to the train. The train is going by, the little cart, and they will see that orange air, uh, beam go up, and they will see the pink beam come right back down to the mirror like so. And so from their perspective, the distance that the light traveled in the same amount of time is considerably farther. But there is something called the principle of relativity, I believe that's what it's called, uh, which says that all frames of, all non-accelerating reference frames uh, are physically equivalent. And so we're assuming that this cart is moving along at a constant velocity and this person is not moving at all relative to the cart. But now we can sort of discover something pretty nice about the physics of the world. By the way, uh, I'm presuming throughout that we know that the speed of light is constant. If it weren't constant, we wouldn't be able to do this, but it is in fact a fixed value. And so what we're going to do is measure this distance that the light had to travel. Because remember, it had to travel it in the same amount of time, right? Because this person is seeing this hit this thing at the same time that this person is. Because, well, that's sort of what we expect, right? These two people have to see the same things. So this person will see the light bounce up and bounce back down in the same amount of time that it takes this person to see the light bounce up and bounce back down. So even though this direction is visibly longer from this person's perspective than this person's perspective, it must be the same because the light is traveling at the same speed. This distance here is clearly longer than this vertical distance here. And since the speed of light is constant, that this beam must be traveling a farther distance, but because the velocity is the same, it simply must take a longer amount of time. And so we're going to have to call this C times capital T for this greater different time. And because capital T is the length of time it took the light to go from here to here, it must also be the length of time it took for the train to go from here to here, which means this distance is V times this new capital T. And we can actually solve for this capital T using the Pythagorean theorem because this is a right triangle, right? We have that C times little t all squared plus V times big T all squared has to be C times big T all squared. We can rearrange that to end up with this. So we get C big T all squared minus V big uh, little t, no big t, uh, all squared equals C times little t all squared. Now we apply the squares, factor out the capital T squared, we get capital T squared is equal uh, times the quantity C squared minus V squared is equal to C squared times little t squared. We can do some more simplifications, we can divide both sides by C squared and we'll end up with 
c squared over c squared minus v squared over c squared equals c squared over c squared times t squared like that. Those c squareds become one. These c squareds become one. We end up with uh, t squared times one minus v squared over c squared equals the original time t squared. Uh, solving for um, big T, we get T, little t, is equal to big, I'm sorry, solving for big T, solving for big T, we get that big T is equal to little t divided by the square root of 1 minus the velocity of the train squared divided by the speed of light squared. And this is the first instance that you will sort of see when you're manipulating these equations that something cannot travel at the speed of light. Because if the train were to get to the speed of light, it would be c squared over c squared, which is 1, and we would have 1 minus 1, which is 0, and the square root of 0 is 0, and therefore we have the original time divided by 0, and so that would not make physical sense. And so this object, this train, cannot travel at the speed of light, because it, well, as a result of it having mass, but that's not really uh, shown here. But this is just to show you that you can sort of transition between this time frame and this time frame using this uh, multiplication factor of 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, which is just a lovely little uh, manipulation of the equations that you can easily derive from these simple physical scenarios. Um, and even though we don't really need to particularly reference the speed of light in these sorts of things, it just is what it is, I still like it. And that is, again, the number 299,792,300. Thanks for watching.